don't want to get COVID or Delta variant. It's just scary because it's like, what is it? And then it's so many different ups and downs of what the vaccine does and what it doesn't do. It's going to allow me to do like many other things other than staying outside, socially distancing. We still need more information about this. It doesn't hurt. It's about protecting what matters most. What does it take to get a more in-depth look into the week's top local news stories? The Debrief brings you inside for a one-on-one -on -one conversation with our reporters every week, right here, right now. The Debrief. Welcome to The Debrief. I'm Paisy Cheng. This week, we're talking about the COVID-19 vaccine for pediatric patients. Children between 5 and 11 are now eligible to get the Pfizer vaccine. Surprisingly, a lot of parents who themselves are vaccinated are hesitant to get their children vaccinated as well. So we found out what questions parents have most, and we found experts to answer them. Okay, so to help us answer questions about the COVID-19 vaccine for children, we're joined by Dr. Sharon Nachman. She's chief of the Division of Pediatric Infectious Diseases at Stony Brook Children's Hospital. Hi, Dr. Good morning. So a lot of people are who, who might have gotten the vaccine themselves are hesitant to give that vaccine to their children. Um, you know, what can you tell those parents to assuage their fear? So first is, how were we able to move the vaccine into children? What data did we need in order to get it to be safe for children? And the safety database in adults is several millions large. And in vaccinology, we know that any adverse event seen in one population would be seen in another. There would be nothing unique that children would have that adults didn't already show. With that several hundred million database of safety from adults, we know that there won't be any surprise or new adverse events that would be seen in children that had not yet already been seen. So recognizing that and also recognizing that the immune response that kids get to vaccines is much better or more robust than adults, we therefore conclude that it is quite safe and importantly effective to use the vaccine in children. And the data that was submitted to the FDA by Pfizer validates that information. You yourself ran trials of the vaccine on children. Were there any adverse reactions, if any? Absolutely, there were definitely adverse reactions, but they were the typical ones we see with pretty much any vaccine. Kids complained of some pain, tenderness at the site. Very rarely did we see any redness at all. And the day after, some children complained of being fatigued or tired. That lasted not more than one day. And those kids all went back to school, no problems, back to their routine, regular childhood activities. What about the more concerning ones that, you know, people have been fighting? Myocarditis. Did you see any? So first of all, the myocarditis rate from the 12 to 30 year old population related to vaccine was four events in 100,000 doses. The vaccine trial only enrolled about 5,000 kids. So there would never be any chance we would see a myocarditis from the vaccine study. Having said that though, the rate of myocarditis in this age group unrelated to vaccine is quite a bit lower than it is in teenagers and young adults. So even if we had enrolled 100,000 kids in a vaccine study, we would expect to see no events of myocarditis related to the vaccine. We might see some events of myocarditis after a million or two million kids have been vaccinated. But remember, myocarditis from COVID is about 10%. So the rate of myocarditis in kids being somewhere in that one in a million or even 10 in a million compared to 10 in 100 kids who get COVID is significantly different. And that's something that parents really don't know about. You know, another problem that they bring up, another concern that parents bring up is um, fertility. They're afraid that their daughters will not be able to have babies if they get the vaccine. What would you say to them? Let's talk about that. And that is an absolute urban myth or rural myth. And it's completely not true. And it's not based on any data. First of all, in order to bring a vaccine into an adult, you have to have two animal models showing that there's no chance that it will affect fertility, both in male animals as well as female animals. And that looks at fertility in adolescent animals as well as pregnancy amongst those animals. 
So there was no signal for fertility in the animal models. Then when you look at the adults that have been vaccinated, there's over a million plus women who are enrolled on long-term follow-up studies that the vaccine did not affect their fertility. And then third and most importantly is when you think about fertility, the number one thing is the placenta, which is made by the baby, which may have some receptor that is not exactly close to the receptor for the antibody. The placenta is made by the baby and the stuff on the baby side never see stuff on the mommy side. That's why women can get pregnant and have babies that have type B blood and they themselves have type A blood and there's no pregnancy loss. So first of all, it's really important to remember the vaccine does not affect the baby. It does not affect the placenta. It doesn't attach to the ovaries and it does not cause any long-term fertility. So these myths are exactly that, just myths. I want to remind people for one last thing, which is that COVID itself does affect fertility. There was a nice study in young males who had COVID looking at their sperm motility and counts. And for at least three months after their COVID infection, they had decreased fertility. So I want people to recognize that COVID itself will affect your fertility, but the vaccine will not. I spoke to a mom recently and she said she had a nine-year-old daughter who she was standing next to. And she said, you know, she's just so little and she's still developing. I'm afraid of what putting the vaccine in her will be. It will not do anything to her development. There are no receptors for any of the antibody that you would make from vaccine on any of the growth and development, endocrine organs that you have, et cetera. So while I appreciate that we are concerned about growth and development in children, when I think about COVID and the COVID infection rates that we're seeing amongst children, and the concern that I have for MISC will clearly will affect their heart and their growth and development, I really say vaccines work. They work to prevent infection. They work to prevent hospitalizations and death. And we should use them in children and think about that part of preventing infection. I was working last weekend and we had three children with COVID in the hospital at that time. And those children, two of them were eligible to get vaccines and had not. One was too young and couldn't get a vaccine, but all three did get COVID, not related to each other from different parts of Long Island. So we are seeing COVID hospitalizations. We are seeing COVID infections that were preventable. So thinking that your child is gonna be the one who does not get sick is quite nice and encouraging. But I can tell you from the other side, what happens if your child is not? And they're the one who does get sick. And this was a preventable infection. Is that something you wanna think about? It's like driving without a seatbelt. You may be a great driver, but I tell everyone, buckle in your kids, wear your seatbelt because you don't know what the other driver is going to do. They may hit your car. COVID is just like that. You may be doing everything you think is right, but someone else is going to give your child COVID or they're gonna bring it home to your grandparent who is then going to get sick. Prevention works because it is equal amongst everybody. It doesn't require you to think about where you're going, what you're doing. And that's why we use seatbelts because we don't wanna worry not only about yourself, but the driver next to you. This was another interesting question that I um, heard, you know, through our research. Let's say you have an 11 year old who's going to turn 12 in a few months. Should you wait for them to get the higher dose of the vaccine? Actually, 11 year olds getting the lower dose had a better immune response than the older kids getting the higher dose. Kids immune systems are just fantastic. They're quite different than adults. And that's why giving them a lower dose enables Pfizer to show nicely that you don't need a higher dose in that kid. So I would tell that family, go ahead and get it. I thought you were going to ask about the kid who's 11 today and 12 tomorrow. What do we do with dose two? And the data from Pfizer clearly shows that if you gave them both times the low dose, they did equally as well as if you gave them the lower dose first dose and the higher dose the second time. No one will be dinged if you give them the lower dose twice and their immune response is still quite good. With the lower dose, do you see that the children's reactions are less severe? Um, you know, is there less pain in the injection area? Do they have less chances of a fever? So they had about a 50% chance lower reactions compared to the 12 to 16 year olds who got the higher dose. Remember, those kids are just a few months different 
but the kids that were older that got the higher dose had about twice the rate of having reactions compared to the kids who were under 12 who got the lower dose. So when I see parents saying, should I wait till they're 12 in a day or should I give them the lower dose? I say, you know what, just go ahead, give them the lower dose. It will be as effective and they'll have less pain, tenderness and kind of reactions from their dose. And, you know, from, I just posted yesterday some pictures of kids, uh, five to 11 years old. They were getting their first dose of the vaccine. It's a really exciting moment, you know, because this was the first time we had seen this happen. But um, some of the negative reactions on the post were interesting. I mean, they said that some one person accused, um, I guess, the parents of committing child abuse. And, um, you know, another person said, oh, they don't need it. This is crazy. Um, a lot of people have their minds made up already, right? It almost seems you're either going to believe in science or you're not. We don't expect to persuade anybody at the very first blush. What I tell families is talk to your child's care provider. Remember, they're the expert in your child. And when you call them at midnight on a Friday night to say your child is sick and tell the symptoms and they give you advice, you listen to that advice. You don't call them and say, ah, what are they talking about? They don't know. I'm not going to do that. No, you say, my child has done this and this. What should I do? And you listen carefully to the advice. The same is true with regard to the vaccines and parents' connection with their child's doctor. Don't go and listen to echo chambers that are saying, don't do this, don't do that. Actually, go to the expert in your kid and say, tell me what's the story. And when they ask questions, listen to the answers. Don't just sit there and say, no, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. As someone who sees children who are sick, that's my job, I only see children who are sick, my concern for COVID is quite high because I've seen all of the bad events. So granted, there are a whole host of children out there who are healthy. You don't ever wanna see me in the hospital and I certainly don't wanna see you in the hospital. And if we work together, we can prevent ever seeing your child here, that would be wonderful. All right. Well, thank you so much for breaking it down for us, Dr. Nachman. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. And that'll do it for this debrief. To find out more about the subject, you can look on our website, NBCNewYork.com. Until next time, I'm Paisy Chen. Uh -huh.